Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so um, welcome everyone. We are uh, joined today by Dr. Young Young Zo. She's joining us from Cambridge, where she's currently um, a scholar with the Harvard Academy for the next two years. She's on leave from uh, the University of British Columbia, where she is an assistant professor of political science. Her work uh, is on a range of issues related to migration and uh, identity politics and how those two intersect. And she's also the co-host uh, with Alan Jacobs of the Scope Conditions podcast, which I highly recommend for uh, those of you who haven't listened to episodes yet. It's just a wonderful insight into especially new sort of early career scholars doing really cutting edge and interesting work and, and you're just such a great interviewer, Young Young. So I just think it's fantastic uh, to listen to those episodes. And I think it's a wonderful service that you're doing for, especially for the political scientists uh, in, the, in the room. Um, so I would like to turn it over to Young Young and I'm so excited to hear what you have to tell us today about your ongoing work. Thank you so much for that. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Young Young, I, I totally messed it up already. I'm sorry. Let me just say, I the only thing I was supposed to say <laughs> is that this talk is part of the ACES Migration Network. So I'm sorry for the ACES people in the crowd, but that's um, that's why we are welcoming Young Young here or as part of the speaker series. And it's we are co-sponsoring it as the Amsterdam Center for Conflict Studies. So now let me really turn it over to you, Young Young. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for that kind introduction and thank you for having me. Um, so today I'm going to be presenting uh, my working paper. It's joint with Guy Grossman from UPenn. It's entitled When Refugee Presence Increases Incumbent Support Through Development and it's evidence from Uganda. So the main research question that motivates this project is how does the presence of refugees affect voting behavior for local citizens? And in terms of secondary outcomes mechanisms that we look at, we're especially interested in how the presence of refugees affects development outcomes and also citizen attitudes um, towards those development outcomes and towards migration policies. Um, so in a little bit, all of these outcomes are gonna make sense together. But just to take that first question, how does the presence of refugees affect voting behavior and elections? Um, we have all of this really great new work on um, how voters who are exposed to refugees, migrants, particularly in Europe and the US and other sort of upper middle income countries, how they've reacted. And in general, um, it's been pretty clear that Voters typically punish incumbents. So we have research from Italy, Denmark, South Africa, Turkey, where um, when there is uh, a large arrival of refugees or, my, or other migrants, um, voters don't like that. They associate with the incumbent government with allowing all of these migrants in. And so they end up electorally punishing incumbents. In many of these places listed below, um, we also see voters turning to anti-migrant far-right uh, parties. Um, and so, you know, this is true across Europe. We also see this happening in Colombia, even though, um, you know, right, right wing, right ideology is not necessarily associated with anti-migrants. These are Venezuelan migrants coming to Colombia. Um, and then the last thing is that we see these voters also supporting more anti-migrant policies. So in general, this paints a picture that particularly in global North contexts and in some middle income countries, um, when refugees come, voters punish incumbents and they become more anti-migrant. But we think uh, a lot of this work 
it's done in places that aren't receiving um, the majority of migrants. Obviously, with Turkey and Colombia, you know, as exceptions, we see here from this graph, which on the y-axis, I'm showing you the number of people experiencing displacement. Um, and throughout time, we see, you know, there's always been this gap with non-OECD countries hosting more migrants. That gap has just grown dramatically in recent years. Um, so now we know from UNHCR that um, 90 percent of refugees, asylum seekers, people experiencing displacement, they're hosted in non-OECD countries, um, in lower income countries. And we think maybe our expectations might differ for lower income countries with respect to this research question. First, um, for a lot of these lower income countries, uh, the refugees coming across the borders, there's a lot of cultural and ethnic ties with host communities, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, in which um, a lot of these borders, they're colonially, they were drawn, um, they're colonial borders, and so they do often divide um, ethnic and cultural linguistic groups, so maybe there's already a lot of cross-border ties. And so we might expect maybe host communities don't feel as negatively um, about refugees coming in. Also, in many of these places like Uganda, um, politics don't necessarily fall on a left-right partisan divide. Um, politics tend to be a little less programmatic. And we definitely see that you know, immigration politics, um, it's usually not as much of a wedge issue. Um, there might be fewer labor market concerns, especially in these border areas um, where, you know, um, a lot of people are working in informal sectors. There also might be fewer concerns about um, migrants coming in having a drag on the welfare state. And in fact, it could be that the presence of refugees um, could be bringing aid and local development to, again, a lot of these sort of peripheral border areas that hadn't seen as much um, public goods provision. And that's the story we're, we're telling today. And of course, we know in these areas, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, voters really care about public service delivery. So here I'm showing you um, distributions from the Afrobarometer, which is this big survey that's done across, um, I think, 34 African countries, at least in this recent round, round seven. And here is a question that just asks um, respondents across all of these countries, you know, what are your top concerns? And you can see for um, the vast majority of them, public goods falls into one of those top concerns. And here, I think Uganda is number six on that. So, um, respondents really care about public service delivery. To put that in perspective, um, one of the issues that they're also asked about is immigration, and no one really said that immigration was a top concern. I think only a couple respondents, like less than 100 in South Africa, said immigration was one of their top concerns. Um, we also know from other work focusing on refugees and migrants, particularly in the sub-Saharan African context, that there are key effects of hosting refugees on local development. Um, humanitarian and development aid, even though they're primarily intended for refugees, they're refugee-related aid, they can still lead to positive externalities for local host communities. Their presence can be an opportunity for the state to develop capacity in really these peripheral border areas. And refugees themselves, of course, bring human and physical capital. Um, and, you know, I've done some interviews with uh, UNHCR and other sort of World Bank officials, and they tell me, for example, in Kenya with Kakuma Camp, um, the refugees coming in from South Sudan have really revitalized local economies in that part of Kenya. And so our argument, our core expectation here is that host communities that are experiencing greater refugee presence and refugee presence, the way we're conceptualizing it is um, for host community, it's if you're geographically more proximate to larger refugee settlements. So these are just thinking about nearby host communities who get a lot of um, experiencing a, a lot more refugee presence. 
that they won't be less supportive of the incumbent and of migration policies, and they may even be more supportive. And so coming into this work, we were sort of just expecting a, a null effect on, um, on voter behavior, on um, electoral outcomes, because we thought, you know, some of these positive spillovers might outweigh the sort of negative attitudes towards these refugees coming in. And our mechanism for this expectation is that positive spillovers from refugee related aid into these areas will address the congestion effects of refugees arriving. And that could lead to better public goods provision for those proximate host community voters. And those voters will attribute um, experiencing better public goods to the government. So there's a few moving parts here. So the context um, where our evidence comes from is in Uganda. Uganda is now hosting, I think, 1.5 million refugees. It's the fourth largest refugee hosting country in the world. You can see that prior to the South Sudanese Civil War that started in December 2013, here it's shown in this red line, that um, beforehand, Uganda was hosting around um, 200,000 refugees, mostly from the Democratic Republic of Congo, and they were concentrated in sort of the uh, southwestern part of Uganda. But after the start of the South Sudanese Civil War, again, um, late 2013, we all of a sudden have this you know, dramatic increase in the number of refugees being hosted by Uganda. And here they're, they're starting to go um, into, of course, the Northwest part of Uganda. Uganda is also the largest refugee hosting country in Africa. Um, and this map from the UNHCR gives you a sense of you know, how many refugees Uganda is hosting, where they're coming from. But you can see you know, all throughout East Africa, many of these countries host large numbers of refugees and they've been doing so for a very long time. So we're really interested in this cutoff of 2014 when the South Sudanese war basically starts and all of these refugees come in. Um, so that's shown here in this red line again. In this first plot, I'm showing you the number of newspaper articles that mentions refugees or migrants or displacement um, in Uganda. And you can see basically around this time is when the number of articles dramatically increases. We also look at this, of course, normalized by total number of articles and we see the same thing. So this plot just tells us that it's particularly after 2014 that um, the saliency of refugees as an issue for this country also grows. And here on this plot um, on the right, I'm showing you the total um, uh, aid um, in, in millions of dollars. Um, I don't have data, unfortunately, before 2014, but we can basically see that um, after 2014, the, the amount of international aid coming in that's purely for you know, refugee-related programs um, also dramatically increases. And what's really kind of special about Uganda is, um, if any of you know anything about you know, refugee hosting in Uganda, they're generally considered quite progressive in how they host refugees. It's not to say that there aren't problems, obviously, and you know, tensions and social conflict in Uganda, but compared to many other countries in the world, even compared to neighboring countries like Tanzania and Kenya, um, Uganda is considered quite progressive. And so here are some news articles, for example, about how Uganda stands out in terms of refugee hospitality. It's often praised by the World Bank and the UNHCR as being model treatment for refugees. And, and here's why. Um, so Uganda has an open door policy for refugees. So meaning they, they don't close their borders to refugees. That was up until COVID-19. Obviously, when COVID-19 started, um, they did you know, try closing the borders. Um, and so that means that refugees are welcome to come in. Once they come in, they're also allowed free movement and settlement. And so instead of forcing refugees to be in these formal camps where they're not allowed to leave, 
Um, that's sort of the hosting situation in Tanzania, for example. In Uganda, they're allowed to freely move and settle. And refugees in Uganda have access to local health care so they can go to local clinics, education, they're given a plot of land to farm, and they're given other supports for economic self-sufficiency. So they're really allowed to live where they want and they are, you know, sort of given supports. Even though refugees are allowed to move anywhere, um, only, you know, I think, I guess less than 6% choose to go to Kampala um, and these other urban areas. So the vast majority of refugees, 94%, they're hosted in, in 13 districts, um, basically in the Western part of Uganda. Most of them are in the West Nile region because that's where, you know, all the South Sudanese refugees go and they're located in over 30 settlements. What's also interesting about Uganda is that they've started applying something called the 3070 principle that dictates that 30% of all refugee interventions should also target host community needs. Um, and so, you know, even though 30% isn't that lot, a lot, especially because, you know, the host community population is much larger, um, still it gives you the sense that hosting refugees in Uganda, there really is an eye towards, you know, also making sure that host, the host community benefits. Oh, before I move on, I guess I just really wanted to um, put like the number of, of refugees in Uganda in perspective a little bit. I think between 2015 and 2017, there were about 3 million refugees that arrived in Europe, which, you know, has over 700 million um, people, residents in Europe. At the same time in Uganda, over 1 million refugees entered Uganda with a population of 30 million. So that gives you a sense of, you know, this is a very large scale migration into, into a lower income country. Okay, so now I wanna talk about the data that we have, which we think is really, really cool. Um, the first thing is the unit of analysis. Here, our main unit of analysis is the parish, and the parish is basically the lowest formal administrative unit. Each parish is comprised of maybe just five villages, so it's a very granular um, unit of analysis. We have data across four years, so the elections um, 2001, uh, 2006, 2011, and 2016, these are the presidential elections. Um, and a problem that we have, again, anyone who studies Uganda, throughout this time period, Uganda undergoes um, a lot of administrative proliferation and, and decentralization. And so these units really aren't stable over time. And so a big challenge we had was just to take all these really messy shape files and make sure that we have, you know, stable parish units across all the years. So that took a lot of GIS, matching, manual matching. We had teams of um, undergrads and graduate students helping us basically just get um, a parish data set that can translate through across the years. And we hope that, you know, this is, um, this data is helpful for other researchers studying Uganda. Um, we also uh, have Afrobarometer data. We also have data from the DHS. And so those are other units we're going to be looking at. Our main independent variable is levels of refugee presence. Um, when you think of refugee presence, you probably think it's a binary variable. They're either present or they're not. Um, but this variable is continuous. And I'll tell you a little bit more in the next slide about how we constructed this variable. One of our main uh, um, outcomes, of course, is electoral outcomes. So here we're looking at the vote share for the N NRM. This is the ruling party. This is President um, Museveni's party. Um, they're the incumbent. So we have vote share. We have voter turnout. And we also have a measure called effective number of candidates. Effective number of candidates is not um, total number of candidates. It's basically a measure of um, electoral competitiveness. So we're weighting the number of candidates in a place um, by, um, you know, their, their relative, uh, how, how many votes they've gotten. So basically just think about it as a measure of competitiveness. 
We also um, bring to that a whole bunch of development outcomes across various uh, public service venues. So first we have over 22,000 primary schools, primary schools, they, they're um, public and private. And by private schools, we basically just mean they're non-governmental schools. Um, it's not private schools as if you know they, ha they have to pay school fees. It's just that it's not provided by the government. We also have 3,600 secondary schools. We have a measure of road density, which you know measures like lengths of roads throughout all the parishes that are weighted by road type. So we can also distinguish between like a dirt road versus a highway. We have 6,800 health facilities, and these health facilities, you know, they're geocoded, and they also um, vary by type, so we can differentiate between a tiny health clinic versus a hospital. I think we have over, you know, six types of health facilities. And we also have a measure of health utilization. So the difference between health facilities and utilization is that when we're looking at health facilities, we can tell if there are new facilities built and by what type. But of course, that doesn't really capture if there um, are just regular improvements into existing health facilities. Um, so health utilization is we're taking DHS data, and here we have measures that combine um, like uh, children use of health. So these are things like are kids getting immunized? Do they have their tetanus shots? Do they have mosquito nets? Um, we also have maternal um, health utilization measures as well. Did they get prenatal care? Um, were they able to give birth in a hospital setting? All of those variables. Next, we have public opinion. Um, and this is because, you know, just because, and we'll show you later, um, public goods outcomes get better in these areas, it doesn't necessarily mean that voters are recognizing it. It doesn't necessarily mean that they are subjectively feeling that public goods is getting better. Um, and so here we turn to public opinion data where we have rounds three through seven of those Afrobarometer surveys. Each round gives us about 2,400 respondents. Um, this isn't a panel, so this is repeated cross sections. And we look at questions like their support for the president, how effective they think the government is at public goods provision. We look at their attitudes towards migration and migration policy. And we also um, look at some of the questions where, you know, about insecurity. So are they fearing crime in their neighborhood, for example? And added to all of those outcomes, electoral development, public opinion, we have a whole range of control variables as well, again, at the parish year level. So some of these control variables are demographic, some of them have to do with agriculture, um, the share of people co-ethnic with the president, and various distances, like distances to a major road, to a capital, to the border, et cetera. Okay, so now I said I'm going to tell you how we construct our main independent variable of refugee presence levels. The first thing we do is we just thought, okay, for a host community, a host parish, we want to capture the sense that um, host communities are experiencing more presence if they are geographically closer to larger refugee settlements. So here is our first measure, we call it nearest. And that's based on, for each parish, what is the nearest settlement in that year? It is, then it's going to be a measure of the population, the refugee population of that settlement. So we're taking into account the size of, of the refugee settlement divided by distance, and then we're gonna log that. So that gives us a measure of, you know, if you're closer to, um, for your nearest settlement, larger settlements, that, that, that means you are more exposed or you have um, a greater presence level than a host community that's farther to smaller settlements. But this only takes into account your nearest settlement. Of course, you know, um, host communities can be exposed to multiple settlements at the same time. You could be surrounded by refugee settlements. So our next measure also takes into account all the settlements within 20 kilometers of the parish. And then a variation on that is um, nearest plus 50, which we also take into account all the settlements within 50 kilometers of the parish. 
what all of this means is that, you know, for each parish year, we just want to capture the sense of, are you near um, settlements that are larger? And if you are, then you are basically more exposed than, than other parishes. And, you know, if you look at the other literature, a lot of times migrant presence, they're just looking at, you know, it's, it could be binary, like, are you within a settlement or not? Um, it could be a share of refugees in your district, for example. But here we think we're making a lot of innovations in our measure and that it is continuous. It does take into account multiple settlements. Um, and yeah, we really capture this nuance of geographic distance as well. So all measures are standardized with mean zero and standard deviation one, and hopefully that'll just make it a little bit easier to interpret our effects. Okay, so now here, um, I just wanna show you over time what refugee settlements look like in Uganda. As you can see, there was this rather large settlement here in 2000. The population was quite small, even though the area size is quite large. So um, that's the other thing, like it's, it's very important for us to know actual population in the settlements because they could be quite spread out. But this place did close and a lot of people moved um, further west. And then so here I'm showing you with this orange shading, um, all of our parishes across the years, they're shaded by this presence measure. And so the main presence measure I'm going to show you all the results for is that, that nearest plus 20. So we're taking into account your nearest settlement and then any other settlements that are within a 20 kilometer radius of you. And so um, hopefully this map gives you a sense that, you know, parishes that are closer to larger um, and more populous refugee settlements, they have more of this presence measure. The other thing is we just wanted to plot the presence measure over time across you know, the three different ways we're conceptualizing it. And we can see definitely you know, for our 2016, which again, that comes after the start of the South Sudanese Civil War, that this presence measure is, is larger. Um, and so that was just a nice gut check for us, a validation for us that yes, we, you know, I think we have um, constructed this measure correctly. Okay, now I'm gonna turn to the results. Our main outcomes, again, is those electoral outcomes, vote share, effective number of candidates, and voter turnout. Um, here, we, I'm going to show you that refugee presence, greater refugee presence, increases incumbent support, so that's vote share for the NRM, but it doesn't really affect turnout. So first I'm gonna show you here, if we look at each graph, this first um, estimate is baseline exposure. So that's just the baseline relationship, the pure relationship between refugee presence and your outcome at the baseline year of 2001. So what is just that relationship in 2001? And then each of these subsequent estimates is the difference in difference estimate relative to that baseline here. So all of these estimates after this dotted line is showing you the relative change or um, sort, of, sort of the relative slope um, relative again to that baseline year. Um, the other thing just to, to clarify is again, the here we're showing you um, S uh, results using that nearest plus 20 presence measure. We also have a radius cutoff of 150. What does that mean? That means we're only including parishes that are within 150 kilometers of any refugee settlement because it wasn't clear to us at the onset that, you know, um, parishes that are super, super far away from any refugees, like what, what does that even mean to them? And so throughout our analyses, we do robustness checks with cutoffs of 100 kilometers, 150, 200, but we also have an analysis that uses all the parishes. And across these like variations of the independent variable and the cutoffs, our results look very similar. Okay, so now to the results. Oops. Here we go. Um, 
So first, let's turn our attention to this first plot of vote share. We can see that in the year 2001, our baseline, there's a negative relationship between um, host communities with greater presence and vote share for the NRM. And so that means, you know, what that really tells us is that in these places in the year 2000, places with greater exposure, mostly bo these border areas, peripheral areas, they're less supportive of Museveni. Um, but as we look throughout the years, um, we have a positive relative effect. And so here we can see in 2006, in 2011, um, this positive effect, if you, if you add each of them separately to this baseline year, it's still an overall negative effect, right? So relative to this negative 6%, we see an improvement in a one standard deviation change of presence. Um, it's an improvement of like 2%. And here it's an improvement of 5%. Um, but what's really cool is by 2016, and this is precisely when we get that large arrival of South Sudanese refugees, we have our, our biggest positive effect. And that even sort of offsets this initial baseline negative effect. So now in 2016, what we're saying is that a one standard deviation change in presence level, so going from like a less exposed uh, parish to a more exposed parish, um, you're actually getting a positive effect for um, vote share on Museveni. Next, we look at effective number of candidates. And again, this is a measure of competitiveness. And we see, you know, a negative effect over time. And that means these areas are becoming less competitive because Museveni is doing better. And then finally, with voter turnout, we see, you know, there are some slightly positive, they are statistically significant effects, but they're very small effects. So what this is telling us is that it's not necessary that in these places, um, this, you know, positive effect on vote share is because Museveni's party is turning out a lot of new voters. We think what it's really telling us is that, you know, voter turnout improves a, a little bit, but um, this effect is really coming from existing voters changing their minds. Existing voters um, who before supported opposition parties are now supporting the incumbent party. We also look at the same relationship nonlinearly. Um, so here I'm showing you generalized additive models nonlinearly over time. Let's take a look at vote share. And again, we see the same pattern. So um, uh, the, this axis down here is levels of exposure, and we can see that for the most exposed or parishes, they're the ones with the greater refugee presence. In 2001, there's a negative relationship with vote share, but by 2016, it's a large positive relationship. And on this bottom plot, I'm showing you voter turnout. It's pretty stable over time. So again, we think it tells us the same story. It's not really driven by turning out new voters. You might wonder, okay, we've done a difference in differences model interacting by year um, that requires this assumption of parallel trends, right? So here um, I'm going to show you these lags and leads. Basically what we do is we set the effect um, in 2011. This is the our year before the, the South Sudanese Civil War. We set that to zero and we want to see if there were, you know, trends beforehand. Um, there's some slight positive effect in 2006, but it's still pretty small. It's not until 2016 do we see this very large positive effect in vote share. So we think we're, we're pretty okay in terms of parallel trends. And so this tells us a story that um, especially in 2016, after this massive arrival of South Sudanese refugees, Host communities, those who have the greatest exposure to refugees, are somehow more supportive of Museveni. They're changing their vote from the opposition. And the question becomes, why? You know, we were even surprised to see this effect, given all the existing research showing us that the incumbent should really be punished. And so we look at these local development public goods outcomes. And here um, we're going to see, you know, across uh, public 
primary schools. Um, we also have similar effects for secondary schools. Across public primary and then similarly for secondary schools, again, we see this huge um, positive effect, uh, especially in 2016. What's interesting is that it looks like when we look at private primary schools, and this again, this just means non-government funded primary schools, um, at the baseline year, we actually had a positive effect. So that tells us that in the past, it was probably, you know, um, especially in these peripheral areas, it was these missionaries, like charities, other organizations that were really supplementing the lack of public schools in these peripheral areas. Um, they don't change that much, but it's really the public schools that get much better. Um, access gets much better. We also have positive effect for road density, for access to healthcare, and for health utilization. And so this is telling us that, um, you know, really over time, especially with more refugees coming into Uganda, local public goods across all of these venues gets better as well. But do voters perceive it? And here we see some evidence that, yeah, we think voters do perceive it. So we have positive effects for um, approval of the president, for trust in the president, for trust in the NRM party, um, for government performance, especially in 2016. Um, and for example, in, in 2016, especially for voters perceiving that um, local education in their communities has gotten better. So not only objectively are their public goods improving, but subjectively they're also um, perceiving that. Um, and lastly, you know, we wanted to look at their opinions towards migration and migration policy. And we don't necessarily see that much difference. Um, so there's this question about wanting are you okay with having migrants as neighbors? We don't see much change for that. Um, or, you know, here we only had one year of data because sometimes the Afrobrometer asks different questions, but we don't see, you know, huge effects for, for uh, thinking that migrants shouldn't be able to move freely. Um, these two questions, born non-Ugandan and able to naturalize, um, it's about, you know, if someone was born in Uganda, should they have access to citizenship? Should they be able to naturalize? Um, for born non-Ugandan, we see a negative effect. So places that are more exposed, um, they're less likely to be okay with someone, you know, um, being born in Uganda, having access to citizenship. And yet they similarly recognize the ability to naturalize. So for people who have foreigners who have lived in Uganda for a very long time, like refugees, should they be able to have the option of becoming Ugandan? Um, we also see not that much difference in feeling unsafe in their community, but they do subjectively perceive, you know, that there's that they should be more fearful of crime. Um, especially in 2016. Again, these areas, they're getting a, an influx of a lot of new people. Um, and so we see that sort of borne out here that there are some fears of insecurity. When we turn to ACLID data, so this is data on actual violent events that are geocoded in a country, um, we also see some evidence that maybe there's a little bit more violence um, in, in the later years for these more exposed parishes. Okay, so let me put that all together. I think the implications of this research is that um, more inclusive refugee hosting, especially in a lower income country setting, we can see that it can lead to positive development spillovers because of all of this refugee related aid coming in. Citizens recognize those benefits and um, they turn around and, and are just more supportive of the incumbent during elections. In this context, we're showing that voters are responding to performance. So it is a case of retrospective voting. You know, you might be thinking, yeah, Ugandans an authoritarian country, what does this mean? Um, I think we're showing you that voters are still responsive to performance, even in this authoritarian context. 
We actually view Uganda as a rather hard test. Um, again, we weren't really expecting to see these positive effects. That's because Uganda hosts such a large number of refugees, especially relative to the, the population of Ugandans. Um, and they are known to have such liberal open door policies to refugees. So if anything, we should have seen a backlash um, for those affected communities. I think it also tells us putting this work in perspective of you know, other research in other places that backlash against migrants is not a generalized phenomenon. Um, just because a country accepts all of a sudden a large number of refugees, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be um, social backlash or violent backlash. Um, we're quite optimistic in showing that, you know, host communities can also recognize the benefits of hosting migrants. And we hope this work has some policy implications for um, refugee hosting policies, like we're thinking about the recent Global Compact of, on Refugees that really talks about self-sustainability for refugees and benefits for, for host communities. So thank you so much. I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. Thank you, Yang Yang. I think if you, um, yeah, great. And then if everyone else would like to join us on screen, that would also be wonderful for those of you who are, you know, available for that. Um, let's do a round of questions and comments for Young Young. And to do so, just use the please um, the raise your hand function, um, the yellow one. And uh, since we do have so many different um, friends and colleagues here, could you just in briefly introduce yourself so Young Young can also sort of situate you within within the Netherlands. <laughs> yeah, Ursula, go ahead. Hi, yes, uh, nice nice to meet you, Yang Yang, and uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. I'm, I'm also a fan of, of your podcast. So, so when you were talking, I was thinking like, it was a little bit confusing because I, I listened to that and, and I haven't heard you uh, speak live. So, so that's really nice. Um, Thank you. And I, I also have to leave a little bit early. So just, you know, to let you know why, why I'm going to um, uh, head out. Um, but yeah, so I'm a, I'm a colleague of, of Abby's in, in the Department of Political Science. I'm, a, I'm an associate professor here. I work on political violence. So this is, you know, a little bit different from, from what, I, what I study. Um, I think, yeah, it, it sounds, you know, like a really great paper, really, really nice work. I appreciate the clarity with which you presented also the mechanism and, and what you were arguing and not arguing and, and how you explained the research design and, and the figures. I, I really appreciate, you know, having nice visuals. Um, so a question I want to ask you, uh, if you could say a little bit more about working with the Afrobarometer data and some, some challenges uh, you may have faced there or not faced, or, or, or basically I'm just curious how you went about it, because the Afrobarometer data uh, from, from, from having worked with it a little bit, uh, from what I understand is, you know, they have really nice samples, but they're not representative below the national level. Yeah. And I wonder if that non-representativeness in, in using it for parishes, whether that could create some problems in terms of measurement error and um, also how you went about parishes that aren't sampled at all, like how you constructed the indicators for those. Um, and then I was also wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, the risk of, of over-reporting for the incumbent in an authoritarian environment and whether that might be in some ways linked to also you know, whether that could be linked to the refugee communities, right? Might we have reasons to expect more over-reporting there and could that could that affect your results? Um, does that make sense? Yeah, that's a super interesting question. So starting, oh, should I um, just answer one at a time? Okay. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say, you know, Afsun, who's Afsun Afsahi, who's one of my new newest colleagues at UBC has said such wonderful things about all of you. So I also feel like I slightly know all of you a little bit. Um, Okay, so for the Afrobarometer data, I don't think I was actually that clear about the analysis. We're not using parishes as the unit of analysis for all the Afrobarometer stuff. We're just using Afrobarometer respondents as the unit of analysis. So for that unit, um, for that analysis, it's respondent year basically, and then we're doing a, like a cross-sectional comparison over time. But you're totally right. Um, the Afrobarometer it's a nationally representative survey, and so it is not you know, super um, okay to do sub-national 
comparisons with Afrobrometer, but people still do it anyways. And so we would just say, take it with a grain of salt in that it is not um, you know, representative at different subnational levels. Um, we still, when we plot it out, I think I have maps in the um, in the SI for the Afrobrometer respondents. When we when we show you geographically their spread, they are quite spread out across Uganda. So we definitely still have respondents who are living in those parts with refugee exposure. You might be, um, you know, concerned that they're going to be mainly focused in sort of the eastern urban parts, and that's not the case. Um, but but still, it's only 2,400 respondents for each round. So we can take that for with a grain of salt. You're totally right. Risk of over-reporting for the incumbent. That's interesting. I haven't really thought about that um, in that it, it would what it would mean is that it would have to be strategic enough that it's only these places that are host communities, basically, that are somehow over-reporting for the incumbent. Um, a couple of things for that. You can see that we didn't include the 2021, the most recent election. Um, and I think that's because we were concerned that there wasn't selective um, over-reporting or, or vote buying or whatever, um, specifically for those regions, but we were concerned about the data quality as a whole in terms of the electoral outcomes that we saw in 2021. Um, with the most recent elections, they have been way more violent and contentious, and we've seen Museveni really crack down and repress um, on, on the opposition. So for that reason, we didn't include it, but I don't know, reviewers might want us to include it. Um, and so, yes, definitely, you know, this is an authoritarian setting. And so there is vote buying. Um, but I don't think there's something specific about these communities. Um, Museveni doesn't need these communities to win. So, so we don't think there's something about them that, that they would necessarily over-report. Um, but I have to think about that a little more. That's something I can ask Guy. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Yang Yang. Does anyone else have a question? And if not, I will put myself in the queue. Oh, Imka, go ahead. Hey, so thanks for a great uh, uh, presentation. I'm sorry I was a bit late. I was running over from uh, class. <laughs> um, so I missed, uh, I, I missed the, the, the first uh, couple of minutes, but I would love to hear more um, about your spatial data. So I, I jumped in right as you were talking about how you match these subnational units. And from experience, I know that you know, that's always a nightmare and it's really challenging to track subnational units over time and to match sort of units across different shapefiles. So um, yeah, it, it, it's sort of a data nerd question, but I'd love to hear more about how you tackled that and uh, um, how that went. Yeah, that took months. I, I think that almost took a year. <laughs> It took a very long time. If you go to our um, SI, our supplementary information, I think there's like 25 pages describing how we did it. Um, but basically, yeah, we're looking at these parish units across time. We do have shape files that ma roughly match the years of our analysis. So they might be one or, or two years off. Um, and so we can see how they translate over time. Um, when we came into this, we assumed that parishes were stable. We knew districts weren't stable. Um, you know, districts change all the time, especially in Uganda, and they get broken up. But we thought when they got broken up, parishes would still be stable. And so um, because they're like five villages, we thought, you know, that that would be stable over time. And we were shocked to see that they weren't. And so across, you know, even four years later, the same parish might be broken up into two parishes and like subsumed into two different parishes. Um, and so it was a lot of working with the shape files. We had names and like other identifiers for parishes. So we used um, like different record linkage software to just also make sure in terms of like names and things like that, we're tracking the same units over time. Um, so we use like FastLink, for example. And then we still had a lot of units that we couldn't find matched over time. Um, and so that's when we hired a whole team of undergrads, basically just to do manual checks for us of everything that was left over. So that's kind of what it was in a nutshell. Um, we're lucky that Uganda still keeps track of this really well. Um, I think other with other countries, it would have been 
really tough. I mean, can I ask, like, are you working with Ugandan data? No, so I'm not working with Ugandan data, but I'm, I'm working a lot with spatial data. And I just, uh, so I've been working with the DHS data as well. <laughs> and, okay. uh, um, so, I, so yeah, so I, I sympathize and I have great admiration for um, how you've tackled that. Um, one thing I also wanted to ask is, so you, you went for the, uh, the way I understand it, sort of the smallest available spatial unit, right? Which I think makes perfect sense because then, um, uh, you you get you get more variation, but you also um, get more sort of these distance uh, variables. Probably work better if you work with small units. Um, yeah, and we also had electoral yeah. outcomes at the parish level, which is really cool. Um, we actually have electoral outcomes at the polling station level, so it was even smaller than parishes. Wow, which, that's amazing. yeah, Uganda's like that. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Do you think you could use bigger units as well? Like, do you think your results would be the same if you used um, larger units, if you used, like, if you group parishes together or something along this line? Yeah, I think it would. And I think it would because there was another paper that came out just a few years before us by Merle Crybaum. Um, and she uses larger administrative units. I think she uses districts. Um, and in her paper, um, she's not looking at electoral outcomes, she's looking at development outcomes. I think she's looking at schools. Um, I have to remind myself, but she's looking at schools. And this is before the South Sudanese arrival. So she's looking at like early 2000s um, and only the Southwestern part of Uganda. And she finds similar improvements in schools in that area with districts. Um, and so I, you know, I hope we're building on her work by looking nationwide and also at electoral outcomes. Um, but at least just like a validation check, other work using larger units does find like better development in these areas. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, does, um, so I will insert myself now. Oh, Juan, never mind. <laughs> Okay, I will go and then uh, we pass to Juan, but um, so I also, I mean, I really think this is great work and I appreciate it just like Ursula, like how clearly you um, described and explained all your data and what you did with it. And so my questions are not necessarily directed towards improving, you know, the inferences you're making about your questions, but just zooming out a little bit to the political environment to think about you know, one one thing that sort of um, occurred to me is this idea that, you know, people are also observing improvements in public goods, right, over time. And we, and when you're making a kind of comparison or the unexpected finding that people don't have such a negative reaction to the presence of migrants, um, it seems like in a lot of other contexts, that negative reaction is sort of spurred on by politicians, right? And the narratives that they present to people where even if they are experiencing an improvement in public goods, like your mechanism, they won't interpret it like that, or they won't interpret it as linked to migration in a positive way, if anything. And so this finding that you have about, you know, that these districts become less competitive was interesting to me because why isn't there like a political entrepreneur who would come in and say, hey, you know, just disregard your actual objective reality and um, get mad at these people with me and then, you know, vote against Museveni. And so I just, I wondered if you could speculate, not that I would want that to happen, but I could imagine a world in which it did happen. And then we would see potentially more similar you know, punishment or the kind of punishment maybe that you anticipated initially. So th that was just a very- That's such a good question. question. I'm happy to speculate, especially because this is basically our next project. Um, in parallel to this, we've been working on a text analysis project where we have, Uganda is so cool. You guys, everyone work on Uganda. They have um, these things called Hansards, which are parliamentary speeches, and they provide them publicly since going back kind of 
for decades. So we have everything that every member of parliament has said. Um, we also have like party manifestos. We also collected all the newspaper articles that mention anything about migration or refugees. So in this next project, we've collected basically media and political rhetoric about refugees. Um, and we've been having a team of undergrads code them basically so that we could run a machine learning algorithm on them. Um, but basically what we see is over time, um, the salience of refugees as a topic has grown. There is a little bit of separation. And so, sorry, just to take a step back, there is, um, you know, there's a party, there's an NRM newspaper and there's an opposition newspaper. Um, and so at least in newspapers, we see a little bit of separation in terms of like valence towards refugees. So the, the official newspaper, party newspaper gets a little bit more positive towards them. Um, opposition gets a little bit more negative. Um, in parliamentary speeches, though, we haven't found that much negative rhetoric, which is also surprising to us. Like, why aren't politicians basically, you know, saying, hey, Museveni is letting in all these refugees? Um, instead, what we've been seeing is that for MPs from those districts, they use it as an opportunity to get more aid. So the speeches look like this, basically, hey, these refugees have come in. It's very important that we host them um, for hospitality reasons. But, you know, like our roads are getting really beaten up. We, we need more funding and development for our roads. And so we see a lot of speeches like that, actually. And so I think these politicians, um, whether they're I mean, the, there is a bias in the number of NRM politicians who speak versus opposition politicians who speak. But a lot of them use it as a way of like an opportunity to, to get more goods for their area, actually. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but like that's sort of the, the, the dialogue that's happening in Uganda. And I don't know if that would work in other places, because, of course, like, yeah, thinking about Colombia, right, we do see politicians talking about Venezuelan migrants as the socialist leftist threat. Um, and so you have to vote more towards the right right wing yeah, parties. Or just crime. I mean, even the yeah. mayor uh, um, yeah. blames them. Um, no, but I think that's good. And I think then some some little information like that included in your conclusion about mm. that it wouldn't, this isn't just a matter of like an authoritarian context where this entrepreneurial politicians can't really start this frame, but more that even these opposition, even, you know, the, the evidence you have is that opposition politicians are still remaining within this kind of frame and also just using it to their advantage in terms of redistribution. Like there's Western politician could also opt for that route, but we don't see it very much, I guess. Yeah. Okay, Juan. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm Juan Masulo, and I'm an assistant professor at Leiden University. Um, thanks. First of all, thanks for, for your presentation. I have to apologize because I joined like 10 minutes late, and I don't know if in those 10 minutes you actually covered what I'm uh, going to ask. So um, as if, if I understood well, you have like, you can we can group the outcomes you're interested in in, in three main groups, some electoral stuff, some attitudes, um, or support towards migrants and then the development beat. Um, and I can easily see how exposure to migration can affect each of these three, but I was wondering to what extent, theoretically speaking, we should expect or we can expect the same mechanisms to actually, or the same one mechanism to actually drive the effect of um, exposure to each of these three groups of outcomes that look quite different to me. Um, wait, I'm sorry, can you repeat the last part of your question? I just want to make sure I'm understanding. Yeah, so basically whether the same reasons why exposure shapes whether people vote more or support the incumbent more, are they want this, the same mechanisms that will shape whether they support um, migration um, more or less or whether they shape their attitudes um, towards them. So basically how the same mechanism travels across the different sets of outcomes that you actually measure. Yeah, I mean, I think we're saying that development is the main mechanism, right? So because um, with these refugees coming in, we can't really separate 
the effect of the aid from the refugees. Uh, sometimes I get a question like, well, so you're not really looking at the effect of refugees, you're just looking at the effect of international aid. And we're saying this international aid is directly tied to the refugees. If the refugees weren't coming in, they would not be getting this international aid. Um, and we saw the numbers, they come from UNHCR, they come from the World Bank. Um, and, and so what's interesting about how refugees are hosted in Uganda is that because they're allowed to self-settle and because when they self-settle, they just use local services, that aid gets directly fed into local schools and health clinics. That's different from, for example, if we go south to Tanzania, where I've also done field work, their refugees are enclosed in camps. And so the refugees have their own schools, their own health centers, local host communities don't have access to them. So it's basically like its own little institutionalized world. But in Uganda, yeah, because they all share the same services, aid gets fed into building new schools that Ugandans and refugee children use, so on and so forth. Um, and so that's the main mechanism in that the way refugees are hosted in Uganda leads to when, when a lot of aid comes in, it also you know, host communities can benefit. And so the, the next step from that is our host communities understanding that they're benefiting, do they actually see, you know, experience new schools and better roads and better healthcare? And that's where the public opinion stuff comes in. Um, so we see that, yeah, it, they do seem to not only recognize that um, service provision in their areas is getting better, but they credit it to the government. So why don't they credit it to UNHCR, right? That is where the money is coming from. And I think there's a lot of work in these development spaces that because, um, you know, Uganda has always, has relied on international aid for a lot of its, um, you know, expenditures that their voters are fine with it coming from an international source, but they give the government credit because they're saying, well, the government is, you know, channeling this to, to our areas. Um, so there's like a whole credit claiming literature of the voters are fine, even though like the initial source is international, they're still going to credit the government because of, you know, better public goods provision in their area. And then the last part of this piece um, with development as a mechanism, the last part is, okay, they've credited the government, are they going to retrospectively vote based on this? based public goods provision. And we see that from the Afrobarometer, public goods provision is probably the top thing that voters care about. And so they do vote based on that. So when they get better goods in their communities, um, they, they reward the incumbent for bringing that to them. Is that, is that, does that more clear? Okay. Yeah, yeah, it does. Thanks. Perfect. Okay, I have also Sebastian who doesn't have his camera on at the moment. Oh, there he is. Uh, okay, uh, hi everybody. My name is Sebastian. I am a PhD uh, at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, thank you, Yang Yang, for, for your presentation. It was very nice, very, very good analysis. Uh, I have a, a, a question about the, the mechanism. Uh, it's, it's related with the capability of of of, of government, uh, because I, I think I, I have one concern, and this uh, maybe maybe um, inside the mechanism uh, there are something that happens in this that the government is doing well in, in Uganda, so they are receiving aid and they are uh, sending to the to the settlements and the uh, near, nearby regions, and they are improving the school access, the health access. And I am wondering if it, it will happen in, in every context, uh, inside Uganda and in other, in other countries. Uh, to mention in Colombia, Colombia is receiving a lot of aid, but the government is not doing too much well. <laughs> uh, the, uh, so they are not improving health access nor education uh, access. Well, not not too much. Well, it's improving, but maybe in the same way than than before. So uh, maybe I, I don't know if you are considering this. Uh, it's important to to study the, to analyze the local politics that makes that the aid that receive the country. Uh, how it is transformed to to the effective 
school access, health access. And what, what is happening in the middle? There are local politicians who bargain for, for resources. Uh, maybe uh, local uh, national bureaucrats are have to deal with local politicians to, to provide the aid. And maybe some local politicians don't want to, to receive or receive with condition. Maybe there are some, uh, there, are, there are maybe uh, conflicts, subnational conflicts. Some regions maybe are more able to, 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 to work with this and maybe other regions do not. And I don't know if you are considering this. Yeah, that's kind of a complicated question. I mean, I would love to hear more about the Colombia context because I, I wonder if it does transfer there. I think probably not. Um, I think the way that the aid works, the refugee related aid works is that a part of it does go directly to the national Ugandan government to be redistributed across the nation. A part of it is just direct. So like when the World Bank comes, they just directly go to the refugee areas and start projects. So you see like schools that have like World Bank logos on it. The branding is pretty insane. Um, they do that. They um, We have these data sets of like World Bank um, livelihood grants. So grants for small businesses, grants for farms. And they just, it seems directly give it to both some host community and, and refugees as well. So part of it is just direct. Um, I think it maybe is because, you know, when the refugees come to Uganda, they settle in across these pretty stable, relatively stable 30 settlements on this Western part of Uganda. They're not really transiting. They're not really, you know, going to other places or even really settling in the main city, Kampala. And I think maybe that to me is a difference with Venezuelan migrants. From, from what I know, you know, Venezuelan migrants, they do go to the cities, um, although many are at the borders, but there's a lot of transiting as well. Um, and so like an analog would be, you know, if a lot, if the Colombian government is getting a lot of aid, why aren't they building more shelters in these sort of city transit areas? And I'm guessing they're not, but I, I don't know why I'd love to hear more why. But I think that would be the analog. Um, again, going back to parliamentary speeches, it's exactly the MPs that are in these districts in, in Uganda that are um, lobbying for more aid. Um, and so at, at, I guess part of them are getting it, you know. Um, another concern is that I'm sure the Ugandan government is also concerned with like conflict with refugees, uh, as a lot of host governments are concerned about that. So maybe a part of it is like, yeah, we have to keep these places happy as well. You know, we don't want there to be an outbreak of violence. Um, there's like an ethnic component to it as well. With South Sudanese, there is a lot of co-ethnicity, but even within the South Sudanese group, there's different ethnic groups and some of them have historic um, conflict with other ethnic groups in Uganda. There's so many factors here. There's like a, a lot of good literature on this. Um, I think our analysis is somewhere like at the meso level where we don't go into um, all of these details, but they're, they're definitely there and they're very interesting. Okay, okay thank you. Thanks, Yang Yang. Now to Lila. Yes, thank you. So for me, the question was basically that. Hey, Lila, can, on, you, can you introduce one... yourself? Okay, sorry. I'm Lila Demrest. I'm an assistant prof of political science uh, at the University of Leiden, focusing mostly on African politics. And um, so, yeah, basically, with, with regard to the paper, on the first hand, and I think the framing is like that, it's kind of a positive thing, right? So refugees, their presence does not have to lead, lead to conflict. But on another level, I, I'm not sure how happy I have to be with the story, because if you look at the Museveni regime, they are getting, like, what people are always saying about Museveni is that he welcomes development actors. Um, he makes sure that there's nice data collection about it, which makes us all excited, but it's also a way of supporting his regime. So we are giving him money to um, actually help those refugees. And basically they're gaining, he's gaining further support with it throughout the territory. So I'm like, okay, it's a good thing. And they don't, and it might be like, they don't want conflict, but there may also be, maybe there's some more, negative or pessimistic 
drive to it, that it's also a way of uh, getting money from development actors and increasing your own support for what is also an increasingly authoritarian regime. So I'm not sure if, if, if that is a dimension that you're also looking into or a possibility. And also like on a meta level, I also have a project submitted on Uganda because they have such great data, but I'm also worried whether we as researchers are not being tricked by the same thing that we accuse development actors of being uh, tricked by in supporting the regime just because they're also nice about it. And that's just something I'm struggling with myself, but maybe if you, if you have any reflection on, on that, I'll be happy to hear them. That is super interesting. <laughs> That's a really, yeah, that's a really meta take. Um, hmm. I don't know. I think that's a hard one. Like on the one hand, of course, as researchers, we should be studying authoritarian regimes, right? Like we shouldn't not be studying them. We should be studying them, but um, is our research somehow in a meta way supporting their entrenchment in the country? Um, we think about this a lot, especially as I was saying before, like the recent 2021 elections, as you know, has, has been so repressive, like civilians have been killed, opposition, like Bobby Wine's entourage been like taken and arrested. Um, and yeah, that's, that is the, I guess the veneer at the national level of what's also going on in our paper. And that, I don't know, that's a struggle. I think that's something I have to talk about with Guy. Um, our framing is positive in that um, we're not seeing the same backlash as we would in other places, but you're right, we're looking at a deeply repressive authoritarian regime as well. So what does that mean when, when we, in our paper, write support for the incumbent, like very casually, when we're really talking about support for a very repressive regime? Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I mean, I'd love to talk about with this with you more. With our data, Uganda, you're, I mean, you must know, Uganda is like really incredible with its data, but I think it is in part just so that we can like have these sort of cheerful findings. Um, they like the World Bank there has always been like really good at collecting data. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, a part of this work, we've been working with the World Bank and there's definitely some trepidation with their team about how we frame our findings as well. Um, in sort of the opposite direction, like, because it is so contentious, are we going to, I don't know. Yeah, like, anger that's okay, you don't have government. to know. Just yeah, to I don't know. Yeah. But that's, I don't know either. That's hard. Yeah. I think it's, I do think it would be also okay to um, raise these kinds of uncomfortable questions in, in a kind of introduction and conclusion, right, to at least acknowledge yeah. that it's not um, a uniformly, it's, it's not an unambiguously good story. I think right. that's worth pointing out. And just a brief two finger on this point, you know, the European Union is now really supporting this policy of keep uh, like shelter in the region. Right. It's awkwardly phrased. I don't know how exactly actually it's called in English, but the, um, uh, recently in the Dutch media, they uncovered that a lot of the aid that the Dutch government is sending through this kind of program went to, um, you know, jeeps like armored jeeps that ended up being found at uh, used to crack down on opposition rallies uh, in the last election in the last campaign season. So that's another way like, yeah without acknowledging these ambiguities, right? You might also be un, un, unwittingly contributing to the narrative that this kind of um, policy by the EU is good because people are actually happy with all of the refugees in Uganda, right? And so here it's, you can't control how people will use your research, right? But yeah. it is, um, I think in the way that you frame the paper now, pointing out how much more the Global South hosts refugees and IDPs already kind of implicitly is suggesting like, this is not a great reality even, right? Or like, it's not, it's not okay that the imbalance exists. Yeah, or that the fears in Global North places seem quite overblown proportional, oh, right? Yes, yes. And that I, you're I, right, I, like this, this, 
problem of like, I think I've seen it called like the externalization of EU borders yeah. into Northern Africa and Western right. Africa. You know, we see this as well. I mean, Kenya right now is threatening to close all its camps yet again. It does it every few years because it's feeling like it's not getting enough aid to keep yeah. the refugees, right? Yeah. So it becomes this bargain of aid for keeping people from going up the Mediterranean. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I think, yeah, maybe there is a place for acknowledging these that like you, you as authors, at least don't yeah. want your results to be taken as either like legitimation for the regime or legitimation for these externalization policies. Yeah. But um, Kiji, thanks. Sorry. Sorry to go on. Go ahead. No, uh, uh, thank you, Abby. Oh, oh. Uh, I'm Kiji. I'm Abby and Imkus. Um, uh, colleague at the Department of Political Science. I'm also an assistant professor. Um, and my question is uh, really related to that point about the nature of aid. And I was wondering uh, whether in order to fully enhance your, your story, whether you're able to distinguish the nature of aid being given uh, to these, um, because you're, you're basically saying these are given to the local governments or channeled through the local governments and I was because you're relating it to certain public goods and was wondering whether you have that direct relationship between um because I, I it's, it's pretty difficult uh and, and like the the challenge that you uh try to overcome is like putting different data sets together which is I understand is like a daunting task but one thing that I was uh, I think could address this question and even Sebastian's question earlier is maybe if you can just even at the national level clarify what uh, is the nature of this aid like um uh, and, and so like where does this go like to some extent just to even um give it a bit more convincing um uh story on like it really goes to local public services mm -hmm. um, i think it, we could definitely do that in the paper to clarify that's really helpful to know that that seems like sort of the weakest part of the this long story that we're trying to convince you um we don't have data on the aid itself though like we have national levels of like over time how much has uganda been getting in refugee related aid but we don't have good data at the very subnational level of like exactly where aid goes um that would be really cool but um the only thing we do have is um the world bank sent us like geocoded projects so we can tell where they've held their projects. And when we map it out, it just, it's exactly where you think it is. It's where all the refugees are. So we didn't even bother doing an analysis there because that it's just, it's like concentrated where refugees are. So there's no point in showing you, you know, uh, a coefficient for that. Um, but that's like a part of the aid. It's not the, all the aid that Uganda is getting for sure. Yeah, and and and, and my second question is, um, am I, Correct to assume that there are local elections in Uganda. Um, I was I was thinking because like in my own work I, I looked into like support of like communities to local and national government. It's quite different. Uh, and whether I was wondering whether you, your argument about aid ushering local development and eventually uh, improving incumbent support is also true for local elections or elect local politicians. Uh, because they could be actually facing the brunt of the negative yeah. backlash um, because that's usually the case like they they can't really engage with national politics apart from elections so i was wondering whether you have uh, an indication of um, whether the local politicians are actually facing the brunt of this uh, potential I, i'm just thinking that there's possibly a negative uh, backlash at the local level that's a super interesting question. I have to check to see. I don't think we have that electoral data for local elections. I think we really just have this like vote share for NRM at the national level. Um, but that's super interesting. Like if they're getting negative backlash, I think the other thing that would be really interesting is if they're actually, if they are opposition associated with opposition parties and over time they're seeing Museveni get more support because of these goods, do they actually switch their parties. Um, so we actually see a lot of like local level party switching as well. Um, that's that would be interesting. Yeah, and that would be your local pol pol political entrepreneur that I'd be talking yeah. about. It's at the local yeah. level that's really capitalizing on the political salience of um, refugee policy or re refugee crisis. Yeah, right. 
Yeah, I just had, I had one more um, along these lines in terms of describing. I mean, there's only so much you can do, right? And only so much data you can have. But I do think with, with Kiji, could Kiji's question and Sebastian's question, it would be nice as a reader to know what local goods, local governments have uh, responsibility for. And so that's one thing, because in Colombia, it's, it's, you know, like education and health somehow has to be produced at the municipal level and based on their own budget of, you know, whatever, with very few, some municipalities receive sort of set transfers, but it's also not necessarily there's an, I don't know this to be true, but one guess is that there's not necessarily a sort of normal channel of redistribution from the central government to the municipalities, which would then mm -hmm. be just increased, um, for instance, for education through international aid, right? That, that channel is not sort of distributed like that. It's really localized where the local government has to decide this much for education, this much for health, this much for roads more or less so it would be great to know about that level of deciding which how to re, how to um fund public goods and then the other question that i had a, a little bit earlier is in terms of the settlements so they aren't camps but i'm wondering if you could give us a more you know even more fine-grained <laughs> sense of where people live and how they live together so is it, a, is it a case where like there would be a, re, a village full of re, refugees primarily, and then they live down the road from a village of primarily you know, native Ugandans? Or is it that the refugees settle in a place that exists already and just makes it bigger? Or, how do, how, or is there all different kinds of combinations? So when I hear settlement, mm -hmm. I still hear roughly segregated. I think they're still roughly segregated. Um, I, I've not gone to the Northwest part of Uganda, but I've gone to like some of the Southern settlements. So Nakavali, for example, is a really big one. And what that looks like is when you drive up, there's a big sign that says Nakavali. There's a lot of branding. Um, so you see like UNHCR things and World Bank things and other like Christian missionary things. So there's a lot more branding and that sets it apart from local Ugandan villages, but there's no like, um, like in Tanzania, like an actual barrier where you have to be funneled, you know, it's almost like prison, like where you have to like go through all these checks to get in. Um, it is quite open. And I, I think like Ugan, um, you know, refugees do sort of settle outwards a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember, but there is a difference in types of refugee. Like I think um, one of them, I'm, so, I'm blanking on this, but like some of them are traditionally farmers and pastoralists, so they do use the plot of land that they're given to, to farm, but others, um, they don't really, and they sort of just sell that land to to local Ugandans. So there's definitely heterogeneity there in, in how they're, they're settling. Um, I do know that they often use like the same markets. Um, and so, you know, I was talking with like a Harvard grad student um, and we were having this idea like people um, what's interesting is that UNHCR and World Bank, these organizations sometimes don't know who's a refugee and who's a Ugandan. Um, and so you have sometimes Ugandans and World Bank people have told us this, like they'll pretend to be refugees so that they can get, you know, cash grants and livelihood grants. They'll pretend to be refugees. But Ugandans definitely know who's a refugee just because, you know, these are small communities. They know who's a stranger. And so you see like at the markets, there's different prices. So a refugee buying the same, you know, thing will get a slightly higher price than a Ugandan buying the same thing. So this just goes into all the, these really interesting sociological intricacies. Yeah. Um, kind of, I think I might miss your question, but. No, but I, yeah. also, I also didn't, I phrased it in a way that was disjointed, but I think if you combine a, 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 just like a stylized set of facts about mm -hmm. the settlements with the sort of government, like how the parish, uh, if that is the governance unit, how they would maybe make decisions about how to invest in different public goods that yeah. would affect both the settlement and the, the natives in a way, if you could maybe just a sort of paragraph about that and sure. help the reader 
also sort of graphs your me your mechanism better, even if you don't have the, even if you can't directly observe the, the transfers. That's Thank perfect. You. That's really helpful. Thank you. Good. Okay, does anyone have a final question for Yang Yang? Can I quickly ask? It seems like several sure. people here do study Columbia, and I'm just wondering, like, <laughs> what is going on there in terms of aid and? Oh, I thought you were saying what is going on with our with how many of us there are. <laughs> what is going on with aid um, for Venezuelans or? Yeah. Yeah. And like, I, what do, I don't know, like Colombians think about it. I, you know, like, were they expecting to get some improvements in, in public goods or not really? Is it, I mean, I remember from other papers, there is a sense of economic competition as well. Yeah, I would, I would defer to someone who's been in Colombia more recently than myself. So maybe Sebastian, if, if you want to chime in. Um, but I, my impression is that Colombians did not expect any kind of international aid when the decision was made to sort of regularize, regularize. Yeah. Venezuelan residency. I think, I don't think it was made with a sense of, oh yeah, here comes the UN to support. That My impression is that these international agencies in Colombia are not they are politically important, but not seen as much as a source of uh, development aid. I don't know, Juan, if you agree or not. Yeah, I would be of the same idea. However, I don't know how much this applies also to more um, remote areas that are more like in direct contact with, with conflict dynamics. But I would say that in general, um, especially like from from larger cities and even from from elites, I don't think there's not there's expectation of of support. And I would de link the decisions to welcome Venezuelans from any expectation of this bringing something um, new. Actually, the story that you told uh, for Uganda and the mechanism itself uh, was quite un, unexpected for me as while I was thinking about these issues. For um, for Colombia, so it's it's very I, I think it's very um, counterintuitive if you think it think for me that from the perspective from the history of Colombia, but yeah, mm -hmm. Sebastian has been there more recently, so he he might know much better than us. Yeah, well, in our in in our survey, actually, I mean, we we can validate what Juan just guessed that there are, but there are very few Venezuelans in the regions that were most affected by the war compared to the cities and compared mm -hmm. to, with the exception of the border area. Um, and those are the areas that have more sort, sort of, the, that would see UN kind of personnel or any kind of branding, like you mentioned, mostly USAID. Um, hmm. And so, I mean, it's kind of a silly question, but like, why do you think this large scale, like, regularizations happen. Um, I mean, I know the right, it's not like the same like right wing like in Europe, but um, and that they're they're necessarily anti-migrant, but um, I don't know, like in Uganda, there's the, the sort of, yeah, the sort of myth making around it is that, you know, Museveni was a refugee himself. So he he's always had that sort of rhetoric, like these are our brothers. Um, there's a lot of history of cross-border migration, especially with like the Ugandan civil war in the Northern areas. And I would imagine there's something similar with Venezuela and that just the sort of history of, you know, taking in refugees and conflict. Is that the sort of myth behind it at least? Um, I think that's true for the border oh. region. I think there's always been much, a lot of circulation there where even when I was doing field work pretty far away, you would still hear like, Oh yeah, to get our visa to leave Colombia, we're gonna just cross into Venezuela, offer to vote for Chavez, and then they're gonna give us a passport so that we can travel on, right? So there, anyway, there was, but I, I don't think that was the attitude from Bogota. Bogota feels very far from that border region, mm -hmm. I think. 
so I don't I, I was also surprised, you know, pleasantly surprised, but surprised. Yeah, me too. But I think one sort of a hypothesis that might sound a little bit of a geopolitical conspiracy theory is that for for the Colombian right, um, welcoming Venezuela is also a way to tell the world that we recognize all the misery that yeah. the left wing governments in Venezuela are creating. Yeah. So in that sense, mm -hmm. probably Duque doesn't really, I don't know, but probably their main concern is not necessarily humanitarian, but uh, from a geopolitical perspective, it, it plays very well with their discourse against uh, Venezuela. I see. Yeah. yeah, similar to like the US policy for Cuban, uh, yeah. for Cuban arrivals maybe. Um, okay, so we've reached our, our time limit, but Yang Yang, it was such a pleasure to have you in here about your very impressive work and, uh, you know, all the best with your revisions. Thank you so much for sharing Thank with you. us. Thank you so much. This has been great. I've, I've learned a lot. Thank you so much for your questions and we'll definitely, you know, take these suggestions as we're doing yet another <laughs> rewrite. Good luck. Good luck. We all learned Great to a lot. meet you all. Yeah, thank you so thank much, you. Yang, and um, take care. Yeah, take care, everyone. Be safe. You too. Bye bye. Bye.